When we make measurements in chemistry, these measurements are usually based off of observations that we make of an experiment or substance before us. And there's two types of measurements or observations that can be made. Qualitative observations, and these tell you what is there. They describe characteristics that are present. And there are quantitative observations. These are observations or measurements that tell you how much of something is there. They involve a number and a unit of measure. And primarily, we are interested in uh, what is present and describing qualities that are present in a given substance or a given reaction, but we are more so concerned with the quantitative uh, analysis of that substance or that reaction. Not just, is heat given off or not? We would like to know how much heat is given off. Well, we are fine to know that uh, to make a substance we need some oxygen, some hydrogen to make water, but we're more so interested in how much hydrogen, how much oxygen do we need to make how much water. Uh, so we're very much interested in the quantitative side of chemistry. In order to make an accurate measurement, we have to know three things. First of all, we have to know what the quantity is that we're trying to measure. We have to have a standard against which to compare that measurement. And then third, we need to have some sort of tool for making that comparison. And so as an example, for instance, you could be attempting to measure the length of a football field. The standard of comparison that you would use would be the meter. Um, and the tool that you would use to make that measurement would be the meter stick. So you have to know what it is you're measuring a standard unit of some sort to compare against and a tool which can make. In terms of standard units, the SI units that we use with the metric system for length, the standard unit is the meter. For mass, it is the kilogram. In time, it's seconds. Electric current is the ampere or amp, sometimes shortened to. For temperature, it's the Kelvin scale, not Celsius, but Kelvin. For the amount of substance that we have, we have the unit of the mole. And finally, luminous intensity is represented by the candela. So when we read an instrument, in order to read it accurately, first of all, we need to take a look at the instrument itself, and more specifically, look at the markings on the instrument we need to determine the units of the numbered measurements. So whatever the scale is, look for the units. Are they centimeters? Are they milliliters? Are they grams? Are they kilograms? And once you've identified what the units are, then look at the spacing of those markings. Identify what the increment is between marks. And once you've determined that, then you need to read your measurement to the closest marking. Now inevitably you will have some instances where your measurement falls in between two of these markings and so then it becomes necessary to estimate how far past that mark your measurement actually is and so this results in the last digit of your measurement being an estimated value. The rest are measured and there is 100 percent certainty in them according to that instrument. But the last decimal place in any measurement is always an estimate. So you read to the smallest marking possible given the instrument that you're using and you always estimate one additional place. In this illustration you can see that we have a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder and the divisions in between each of those numbered markings it, they're split into 10 divisions, so each line represents a tenth of a milliliter. So when we would read this measurement, we would read not just a tenth of a milliliter, but we would need to estimate to the hundredths of a milliliter. Now with a curved surface like this, when we what we see with a lot of liquids in a graduated cylinder, this is what's called a meniscus. And meniscus forms because of molecular attractions between the material of the container, in this case glass, in some cases plastic, and the attraction of the water molecules or the liquid molecules for themselves. And a lot of time 
this attraction causes the liquid to rise up at the edges where it comes in contact with that liquid or the glass surface. And so when we make a measurement with a meniscus, you always measure from the bottom of the meniscus. And on average, any error that's introduced there usually averages itself out. So with this graduated cylinder that's located on the left, the diagram, the smallest increment being tenths of a milliliter, we would actually record that measurement to the nearest hundredth of a milliliter. And if you take a look at that meniscus, it appears that it is um, positioned right on the line. And it looks to be the 5.5 millimeter mark line, milliliter mark line. And so our hundredths digit, even though our meniscus lands right on one of those divisions, the last digit would be a zero. Does not matter if your measurement actually ends on one of your markings of the measuring instrument. The number of decimal places you report is determined by the increment of those me uh, markings on the measurement. If it's to tenths, you report to hundredths. If the smallest marking is to hundredths, you report to thousandths. You always estimate one additional place. Now, when you read a measurement, parallax can be one of your biggest enemies, and it can be a huge problem. Where you position your eye in relation to the instrument can make all the difference in the accuracy of your measurement. What parallax is, is error in measurement reading due to the position of the observer. For instance, if you hold your graduated cylinder up high above your line of sight, then as you read the reading, more than likely you will get a reading that is too high. If you have your graduated cylinder sitting on the table in front of you and you're looking down at it, then more than likely your reading will become too low. And so the key is when you make a measurement, whether it's with a graduated cylinder, a ruler, uh, a triple beam balance, whatever the instrument is, position your eye so that you are head on with the measurement you're trying to take. And that is the best way to avoid parallax. When we make measurements, a lot of times we use the terms accuracy and precision. Uh, and while they are related, they are not synonymous. So it's important to know the difference between the two. When we talk about accuracy, we're referring to the correctness of the value, to what it actually is, or to some reference value. Whereas precision speaks to reproducibility of a given answer. Accuracy can be checked by using a different method, a different testing method, or simply a different instrument. Whereas precision can be checked by repeating your measurements. If you get the same answer over multiple trials, then you can be reasonably assured that you're precise in your work. Poor accuracy tends to result from flaws in the procedure and also flaws uh, in the equipment or the measurement tools. Flaws in precision typically uh, tend to result from poor technique on the user's part. If we take a look at uh, these four diagrams here using uh, a target and uh, bullet holes, you can see that in the first one, uh, the four holes are neither precise, they're not clumped together, they're all over the place, nor are they centered around the target, the bullseye. So they are. this would be an ac example of not being accurate and also not precise. In the upper right corner, the illustration shows that the uh, four holes again are scattered, so there's no precision there, but on average they do tend to surround the bullseye, the desired value, so we would consider those to be accurate, just not precise. In the lower left diagram you can see that the four holes are tightly packed together, indicating precision, but they are consistently off the mark uh, from the bullseye, so they would not be accurate. And in the last diagram in the lower right you see that we both have the tightly packed configuration of the holes, as well as them being right on target with the bullseye. So this would be an example of being both accurate and precise. One way that we can describe our accuracy is through the use of percent error. By using this equation, taking the absolute value of the experimental value minus the reference value, uh, the reference value would be 
the actual answer that you that would be like your target and that could either be um, a reference value from a data table from a reference book or some other value that you are given that is your target the experimental value is the value that you actually calculated during the course of doing the experiment so you take the difference of those two numbers the absolute value of it meaning that your answer will come out positive and divide that by the reference value and then multiply that by 100. Usually we're looking for a, a, an estimate of the error uh, and so it's okay to round off your values to the nearest whole number. If it's less than one, round it off to the nearest tenth. So looking at some examples here, our experimental value in the first one is 265 centimeters. Our reference value is 270 centimeters. So if we subtract those two 265 minus 270, you get 5 centimeters. And then the reference value, the number that should be in the denominator, should be that 270 centimeters. 5 divided by 270 times 100, and you should come up with a 2% error. Take a moment now to pause the presentation, complete the remaining two examples, and when you're finished, resume the presentation to check your work. The second example here, experimental value of 52.5 milliliters, a reference value of 55 milliliters, the difference being 2.5 milliliters, divided by 55 milliliters times 100 should give you 5% error. And then the last one, 2.5 kilograms for experimental, a reference value of 2.15 kilograms would give you a percent error of 16%.